Like, I'm so sorry. Oh, actually, I'm so sorry because I kind of, like, uh, um, noticed that I have to give this talk, like, an hour ago. So, <laughs> so also, this talk uh, was accepted in DemoCon Europe in two weeks, but uh, you guys got a premiere. Woo! Um, but uh, the catch is, like, yes, as you can see, we are lacking a lot of visual, like, colorful background and stuff because I just finished it. Um, also, um, there's a demo that actually I, I will tell you later, but what you can do, I would suggest, is to take a picture of this screen because that's the most important slide of the deck because you got the link to the whole slide, the whole slide deck. And also, I will update this slide deck when it's more beautiful and stuff so you can come and check back, you will see all the finished product afterwards. Um, so also, you can see all my details and stuff, so if you have more questions, you can uh, drop me a message on either Twitter or actually Mastodon is the same handle, you can still find me and uh, LinkedIn as well, so um, yeah. Okay, let's get started. I'm excited because this, this is my first time giving this talk. Um, so I'm Cher and I work for Alaconda and um, I love open source project. I, I'm basically, I would consider myself a, like a person who is like not just a developer advocate but an open source advocate because uh, I just love open source. And I love organizing events. I am addicted to events as some of you may tell that you may see me multiple times in the past. Um, so that's that's enough about me. Let's talk about um, Project Aladine. How how many people have heard about that? Yes, no, some. Hmm, okay, it's, it sounds familiar because now there's something very popular that's called Pi or right? um, so They are different. So Project Aladine actually is a Mozilla's trial project. Uh, it was started years ago. I think it maybe 2012. I may be wrong because I. Obviously, it's my first time giving a talk. If I'm wrong, please let me know. <laughs> so, uh, so the project idea is to build a scientific tool, an interactive tool for data scientists. For, you know, um, to I will, you, I, will I will show you a picture later. You can see like what it can do. Um, so, because uh, the reason being that now we modern browsers actually we can do more than just showing a page with some maybe funky GIF and stuff. Remember the good like 90s and thousands. <laughs> so um, yeah, we can do more stuff. Uh, and also uh, this project uh, actually is not Python uh, specific. It's actually, they invented this thing called JavaScript Markdown, which is uh, a little bit similar to uh, how you write code in Jupyter Notebook and stuff. They use the percentage magic and all these things. Um, but unfortunately the project was sunset in September 2020 by Mozilla. So that means that it's not supported anymore. So um, that's why maybe some of you haven't heard about it because it's, it's no longer supported. So this is how it looks like. Um, it's very cool. It's like it looks a little bit like bouquet, but it looks really smooth because everything runs in the browser and stuff. And you know, um, the link is down there. If you have get the slide deck, you can click on the link, and there will be more example and like more about the uh, project itself as well. So you can check that out. It looks really, really cool. Um, yeah, so we need to do that. So th this term, you probably have heard about it, WASM, uh, it stands for Web Assembly. Uh, wait, yeah, Web Assembly. What's the last two letter? Anybody knows? <laughs> uh, I forgot, so <laughs> I can't tell you. <laughs> um, so what is WASM? Let's, let's talk about what it actually does. So let's put it this way, um, because now you, you may have heard about like, of PyScript, Pyodai, Wasm, all these things, so how, how can my brain kind of understand what's going on? So uh, to understand what's going on in the web browser, you can kind of think about what's happening in your computer when you run your Python code. So your computer will have a CPU chip, right? And then, well, everybody got a chip, but mine is like an ARM chip because it's uh, the newest uh, MacBook, uh, but if you may, if you have an older MacBook, for example, I have an old one at home, it used the Intel chip, if you're using other computer, maybe it's also using an Intel chip. Um, so you have a CPU chip, so that's doing all the computational things. Um, in web browser, we have a virtual machine. That's like, as the name suggests, it's not an actual machine. There's no chip like on your browser. It's like all, everything is software, it's virtual. Um, so, in, so with the CPU chip in your computer, that actually, you will write, you will write some machine code uh, to, to run it. Uh, that's, you know, that's low-level code, uh, unless you are an engineer who, you know, who, who are trained to do those, like, write those machine code, you probably won't touch it in a day-to-day -day basis. Um, 
so usually what we write is to write, for example, code like Python, but, but some people don't write Python, they write C, so C can be compiled to be these machine code and then run by the chip. So a web browser needs to have similar things. So we need something to compile the code and so it can uh, run. So the machine code equivalent is the WASM, so it's a web assembly. That's why like, because the machine code in your computer is called assembly code. So that's why web assembly is the assembly code that runs on the browser. Uh, so, for example, we have the C compiler to compile the C code. So, what we have on your browser is the mscripten. Uh, is a tool that uh, compile the code to into WebAssembly, so you can run the code. So, uh, I hope you know what is C Python. So, C Python is actually the Python that you download from uh, from the Python and uh, that's, you know, there's also like variation of that. You don't have to use C Python to run your Python code. You can do other things. You, you have IPython, you can use PyPy, you can use, um, you know, other things that, are, you know, that are, can interpret Python. So PyRDA is actually another thing that can understand Python, that can interpret Python. But PyRDA is actually um, designed uh, to, you know, uh, so instead of C Python, it's compile, uh, not compiling, so, uh, to interpret your Python code into C code, PyRDI is interpreting your Python code into WASM, uh, well, and some code and then script and then WASM. So that's why PyRDI can let your Python code run on the browser. So the good thing about it is that on the end of this journey, you have Python. So everybody just needs to like, you know, if you know Python, you can either run your code on your computer or on the web browser. It doesn't matter, like it's the more or less the same. There's some small difference, but you know, your Python code run on your computer, it will run on the browser. It's just you have to use different toolings to go down different routes. So why project uh, project IODI was not more popular? Because well, if it's a popular project, it won't get some set, right? So what what's going on? Um, so the problem with project IODI is that um, you know at that time we have, you know, the project that we know and love is the project Jupiter. Um, so a lot of people who are like data people, data scientists, researchers are actually favoring uh, Jupyter Notebook, Jupyter uh, Lab, and all this. Uh, so it's adopting faster uh, instead of our, uh, Project Aldi, um, because, you know, Jupyter is already up and running and everyone's using it. Project Aldi, you know, they are still kind of developing it and stuff. Um, also, because Project Alda is mainly by Mozilla, uh, there is a lot of involvement um, for, from the community, so it's not a community uh, lead project. So, uh, yeah, so it's very challenging. So they sunset it in 2020, but then it spin out the project that we know today is Pi Alda. So Pi Alda is actually a community-run project, so it's not maintained by Mozilla, it's maintained by the community, and um, so yeah, we are still using it nowadays. Um, so I would always say that we are actually in the age of running Python on the browser. There's uh, all these, you know, popular thing. I, I, I think that you may have to like, you know, you already, because my dear in the last talk, because they also talk about WebAssembly, so in the Python conference, we are talking about WebAssembly code in the browser and all these things. Um, because uh, we have Python, uh, it's become, you know, that's why we can talk about running Python on the browser and not. Um, also, we have all the packages that uh, we, you know, that's what makes Python so popular. They can also be run on the browser. Um, the packages that's written in pure Python, for example, if you have a package that you have written and you haven't shared it to anybody, you can still run it on the browser because if it's pure Python, Python can handle it. But what if there are like packages with like, you know, pandas, numpy, or this, but they are not pure Python, right? They are using some other, you know, C compiled, like, uh, module that you have to use. Um, all the popular ones actually are also available uh, because some, someone uh, in the community already made them available because they have been compiled into Wasm. So, like, the, um, so it's also provided by Pyotai. Um They have these uh, micro uh, tip project or this like different way of distributing it. I won't go down the rabbit hole, but uh, yeah, you can install them. Uh, most of them. If it's not support, no, you can check. There's a list actually online. I should put the link here. Now I remember. Now you can check whether the project is uh, available uh, by Pyodai. Um So also another thing, if you are like, oh, I'm, I'm not a developer. I just want to like do my data science work, like just like I use Jupyter Notebook and stuff. Or well, now you can run it in the browser only because 
the different thing between Jupyter Notebook and, uh, for example, Jupyter Lite. Jupyter Lite is actually a version of Jupyter no Notebook that only runs on the browser. So what are the difference? The difference is that, for example, Jupyter Lab, which is the traditional Jupyter Notebook um, tool, that actually um, it got a backend. So remember when you type, uh, you know, Jupyter Notebook, and then you then your web page pops up, and then there's the Jupyter Notebook got open, and all these things. Um, actually, you're running a server on your computer um, to support the notebook function. So it's not actually um, only running your browser. Uh, the, on the contrary, Jupyter Lite is only running in the browser. So you can just send someone, you know, a you can just you know open Jupyter Lite on the browser, or as a uh, you know your browser plugin. You, you know, if, if you have played with Jupyter Lite, uh, I'm not showing you now, but uh, there's actually you can download the and install um, a extension, a browser extension to use Jupyter Lite. So everything is on the browser. It doesn't need to spin off a server just like Jupyter Lab. Um, so uh, also PowerDive. Uh, so so that is also uh, powered by PowerDive because Jupyter Lite has a PowerDive um, kernel. So that's that's using that. Um, so. Uh, now you can also build front end application. I know you may have heard about PyScript. It's been very popular nowadays. That makes that is like uh, making uh, writing an application, application, web application, front end application to be specific, or with Python to be uh, easier. Because uh, I will show you the code later. That actually you're just writing Python code and then you wrap it with some HTML and stuff, and then voila, you have an application that only runs on the browser. You don't have to do much about it. You just send someone the file, the HTML file, and then it'll do its job. So PyScript, uh, I already explained a little bit, but it's a framework um, that you know is is something that you can use. <laughs> that uh, you can run a Python application on the browser. It has access to DOM, so you can change the the look of the page. Um, it also uh, you can also change the backend. Of course, PowerDive is like the popular one, but you can also use MicroPython to make it uh, execute faster. So a lot of uh, popular package is available thanks to PowerDive. Um, also, if you want to just try it out, you can go to PyScript.com. Um, you can sign up for a account for free, and then you can play around with it, and you know, and, you know, you can create a project. I don't think now you can share it, but maybe in the future you can share it with your friends, so you can kind of. Um, just like code pen, you can share with people. So this is how a script, oh, sorry, it's a bit small, isn't it? Yeah, it's a bit hard to see. I have to change the color. Maybe I can make the girl change the color. Let's see, one second. Change into this color. I think this is better. I hope this is better. And can I make the fonts bigger? Make it a little bit bigger? Okay. Right. so this is a typical uh, PyScript page. I just grabbed it from the, um, Example page of uh, PyScript, and uh, so the key here, first of all, is this uh, this little line that is actually using the CDN to uh, link uh, the JavaScript here. It's to link the the, the, the .js file. Um, well, it's not you know it's we are not writing JavaScript, but the developer has been compiling this uh, to a JS file, so we can use uh, PyScript. So we just need to call this in, or you can host it yourself. It's up to you. Um, but you know it's just demo, so we just CDN it, and um, so this is a to-do app. I will show you how it works later. And you can see this. This is just like pure Python script, right? We are writing an application purely in Python. So this this should be very familiar to all of us. Um, well, the, the color is not highlighting because it's in an HTML file, but uh, you can if you don't want it to be like this, it's so difficult to see. You can write in a .py file and pull it in if you want. And um, yeah, this is the the, uh, the DOM. You can access all these objects inside, so you can change it and stuff. So uh, so this is how it will look like if it's running. So uh, yeah, you can just add some tasks, shopping maybe. I love shopping. So let's edit. So we can edit here. So all of this, you know, you can do it with JavaScript, but now you don't have to. You can use Python and work. Have to actually do work, and then you can cross it out like this. You can change the look of it. Um, so this is uh, all in Python, <laughs> not, in, not in JavaScript. It's quite different from what we used to know. So um, now we are getting the th the front end is bigger and bigger because now you can even load a um, trained model, trained machine learning model. Like I've tried before. I have a scikit-learn uh, 
you know, uh, trained uh, recommender system and things, I can deploy it. <laughs> I can deploy it to the front end and just do a recommend recommendation on the front end. It's crazy. It's very thick. Um, but is this what we want? Uh, because, you know, um, the, the web uh, VM only has 4 gigabyte of memory. You can't really load in a huge data set and stuff. So some, uh, some uh, developer, they're actually uh, going the other direction. And want to make it thinner, it's like, oh, we don't want everything to be in the front end. Um, how about we have everything in the back end and just have HTML in the page? Yes, you can do it. <laughs> That's another thing called HTMX, uh, which, you know, um, the idea of HTMX is to have everything just written in HTML. And you have, again, you don't have to write JavaScript. It seems like we don't have to write JavaScript. So um, using HTMX, you can forget about JavaScript. Uh, it's going to add, so with just some tag, uh, with HTML tag, actually, you can um, add dynamically add elements in HTML. So again, this is something that we would, in the past, we would do, use JavaScript to do it, but now you don't. <laughs> and, uh, they claim that they are very lightweight and uh, you know dependency free, so it's even lighter than React. It's crazy. Um, so uh, here is the bit that I have to demonstrate using HTMS with Django. Um, but some background information uh, there's you know uh, because Django required a CSS our security token, so um, that's. You know, you can't just like, oh, use HTMX uh, with Django, there will be error, uh, call free error if, if it's not set up properly. Uh, that's why there's a plugin there, Django HTMX plugin, so make it easier to just like use HTMX with Django. And um, so you, you can add the HTMX elements in the template when you set up your Django app, so um, it's fairly straightforward, I would say. And then after that, then the, uh, it will dynamically change the page. Again, no JavaScript is needed. So uh, this is one of the examples I found it at, at, on a blog post. Uh, if you want to see the whole blog post, click on the link at the bottom. But this is some of the script that was showcased. Um, so you can see that uh, this is actually, uh, again, it's not very visible. Let me change the color of it. Sorry about that. Like I said, I haven't do any artistic design. So it's uh, very crappy right now. Sorry about that. Let me just change it to bigger. Um, yeah, so just in time. Uh, Presentation preparation. Okay, so uh, so you can see that uh, we also need a um, a file. So this is a CDN file. So uh, here, and it's, again, this is not recommended that you use a CDN because you know the security issue. If you can host it yourself, um, you know you can figure it out. I hope. <laughs> I don't know. I, I haven't. I haven't figured it out yet. So um, so this actually two files because you know. This part of your Django project, these are only in the template, so that's how you set it up. The thing is this this tag here, HX. So you just so all of these actually, well, except this like a ginger kind of you know syntax, actually they're pure HTML. You just need to write um, you know the attributes in the tag to use HTML. So again, no JavaScript is needed. So um, I think that's the thing here. So this is the part that I said that I'm sorry because this actual presentation is not actually 100% finished because I'm supposed to then demonstrate how this looks like, but I don't have time to finish it. So I instead, I will show you the HTMX example. So this is one of the examples provided by Django HTMX. So this is obviously using Django and HTMX. You have to trust me for that. <laughs> so it's running on my computer right now, on the 7 over, over 1. It's running on my computer. and. Um, so this is the page. So I want to show you is this is the, the element, right? So you can see it is you know dynamic and stuff. So in the past, right, you would write a JavaScript probably like you know uh, you will fire a uh, get request and then get all these and then you know and then um, and then change it, right? So now you don't have to. So oh, if I can show you, it's too big for <laughs> me. Oh, I can't navigate it. Okay, it should be in the body somehow. Okay. Yeah, so you can see here. This is just some content, just so some table here, right? So it's, it's not JavaScript, it's just all HTMX. And then if you click on it in the past, if you want to, let's say if you don't write JavaScript and stuff, right? If you, if you do this, you change it, you have to either um, refresh the page um, or you write JavaScript. But now you don't have to. Right? You just use HTMX and it will dynamically replace this element with the new content. And also it will get all these, uh, um, all these, uh, data 
uh, from the back end as well. So um, all is done without JavaScript, just HTML, uh, just attribute from the tag. So um, yeah, I think that's it for uh, for for the demonstration. And uh, so what is the future be like, right? So we have seen one way, the direction that we're going is to like, oh, web assembly and then write Python on the web browser and everything is run on the browser itself. The other direction is that, okay, we just write HTML, everything is handled in the back end, we don't have to you know, worry about anything. So my opinion is that I think both directions, we are switching up JavaScript, right? It's like it's no longer needed. Uh, you don't, if you a uh, front end developer, if you're, you know, you know, writing up this page and all this, you don't have to write JavaScript anymore. You just need to write HTML. Or if you, you know, if you a Python developer, you can just use PyScript and run Python. Um, so JavaScript may probably be considered low level in the future, which is unimaginable <laughs> right now. Um, but it may, it may be. Uh, so another good thing I think this is this movement is going is that there may be more casual coders. It's not like you know, uh, if you talk to someone on the street, right? You just like, oh, uh, let's uh, get a website for your uh, for your small business. So this they will probably oh either use some web service to create it, or they will hire someone who knows the web development to develop it for them. Or maybe in the future they can do it themselves because. Um, with very minimal code, they can do a lot of interactive things on the website. And um, so, yeah, if, if it's not something, for example, handle money and stuff, maybe they can, you know, design a website that's quite dynamic. Um, and also another thing that I could I think about is that maybe there will be more integration with AI models. Now, you know, ChatGPT is super popular and stuff, so maybe, you know, they have the API and, you know, you can integrate it in the web with relative ease. And it will, you know, there will be more people who are just like casually added to their web application. So um, this is, I think, where we're going. And this is really, really the end of the talk. And uh, before I go, I want to remind you that there's another conference coming up in July. Yay! Um, it's in uh, Czech Republic. It's in Prague. Uh, the weather will be nice. Uh, there will be a lot of beer. Uh, and um, yeah, if you want to go, mark it in your calendar and got a ticket. So. I think that's it for my talk. Thank you. Any questions? Any opinions? Any comments? Yes. Oh, okay. Just a thank you very much. Oh. Okay. Just a clarification for us. So, you, uh, how do you like, deploy a front end? You need like an uh, npm or just like it's, it's a dependency because uh, like. Uh, so their syntax is like it not native to support right by the browser. So you need some stuff intermediate step, you know. Yeah, well, HTML actually uh, they are they are actually having let me go to, if I can go to their site, uh, HTML they are actually showing that you can do so you can do uh, Ajax and uh, CSS transition. So it's not really what they do is that they would um, they have the, the, they have a CDN script, right? So in that script, if you, I think, I may be wrong, I have to look it up, but I think what they would do is that when they have some custom tag or just like custom attribute for the tag, so when they see those, they what they would do, they would buy a uh, request. So it's like either a get or post request to dynamically talk to the backend. So, um, so all of them are full uh, requests. And uh, so you can even do like, I was like, whoa, how can you do WebSocket and things? So, um, this is how they do it. You just, you know, use this. I, I bet, like, they kind of, when they see this, they would fire some script to uh, get all this attribute and um, and send some requests. And stuff. But so, I may be wrong. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. so, as an example, TypeScript usually need to have, like, compilation translation step where you, like, translate to JavaScript. So I'm, I'm just thinking, is this, like, just yeah. an import, or you need, like, some extra step to, like, translate it? The, 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 the thing is, I think it's written in JavaScript. Like when they see the custom kind of attribute, it just like replace it with some JavaScript too. So that's why this, we are not really not we are not getting rid of JavaScript. But it's like the develop like the user they don't have to write JavaScript to to achieve the same thing. So it's kind of like another wrapper wrap around the JavaScript uh, you know function. So so just hiding it, hmm? hiding it from from us. Yeah, so that's why I said like JavaScript may be a low level, consider low level because the 
actual users are not really using um, JavaScript anymore. They just do this. Um, so yeah, that, that's very, very interesting, especially for Python developers who are like, you know, taunted by JavaScript in the past. They may prefer this. I don't know. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes, hello. <laughs> Hi. Uh, well, it looks like uh, PyScript is just trying to play the same role as the JavaScript, leaving the freedom for users to interact with HTML, CSS. It's un I think it's unlike, uh, different from other pure Python frameworks like Radio or something. Uh, of course, to Python, to be the light or something like that. So is it, is my understanding right? I mean, is it, you know, there are some intention for uh, the PyODI development team to tackle the sweet spot, you know, leaving, you know, um, making PyODI to just replace the JavaScript, but leave HTML or CSS. Yeah, I think, I think, uh, moving forward, right, like we have, of course, we have now PyODI and we can write Python script. I don't think that's the intention at the beginning. I think it's just that a bunch of people, they want to harness the, 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 um, the power of all these Python library because in JavaScript there isn't a lot of library like we do in, in Python. We have machine learning library, all these you know mathematic libraries that is available in Python, but they they're not uh, available in JavaScript. So I think at the beginning is uh, for some of that project and later part of that project. It's just that we could you know use the Python package uh, for, for uh, you know on the front end and it could be extremely useful uh, for, for example, now I think people tend to um, you know, uh, use it for some data science uh, visualization things, or you could do education, you know, you, you teach uh, kid Python, it's easier to teach kid JavaScript, I think, because you don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. Um, so for education is useful, also um, some, <laughs> some maintainer of Python libraries, they create this like, sandbox that is run on your browser, so you can test out the code and stuff. So, um, I don't think the intention is to replace JavaScript. I, I think it's more for like expand the usage of Python. Anything else? If not, then we can maybe relax. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>